Dr. Arv Grabowskis is here, uh, and he's going to give us an update on diseases and fungicides, and what kind of year are we going to have, Arv? Good question. <laughs> this should work. Page down. I the computer, so. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I have a little bit of a cold, so thank goodness with the microphone this time, I think I'll be able to project well enough in the, in the room. I have several different topics I want to talk to you about, so I'm going to try to move quickly on some of these. Some of them are just sort of uh, brief informational things, and uh, I'll get a little, in a little more detail on the scab issue at, uh, at the end of the talk here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is a potential new disease problem in soybeans. We showed up last season, uh, we've really probably been here for a few years, but we didn't really recognize it until this past season. Um, the symptoms of this particular disease begin as small chlorotic spots on the leaves. Um, they are... See, does this thing have a pointer? No, it doesn't have a Okay, all right. There we go. No problem. They, they begin as small chlorotic spots on the leaves, and the thing is that they're not a solid yellow patch. It's a little bit hard to see from this picture, but if you look closely at those leaflets, you'll actually see a little stippling in there. And they seem to be associated with the, with the secondary and, you know, and minor veins in, in the leaf blade. Uh, it basically, to me, it looks like some sort of feeding injury in a, in a cluster kind of thing. Uh, as the symptoms advance, you start to get a little bit more of discoloration on them, and more importantly, they start to have a more distinct pattern along the, the main veins. You can see that best on this far left side here, where the uh, vein is kind of clearing. Vein is kind of clearing, um, and then you start seeing some of the uh, uh, some little discoloration kind of patches alongside of that. Um, so the symptoms are associated with the veins. It's a virus disease, so the common name right now is soybean vein necrosis for damage or you know death of that tissue kind of virus. This uh, pathogen was really only first identified in the United States, or really anywhere in the world, in 2008. Uh, we have seen symptoms like this in the past in very small kind of uh, uh, outbreaks. Um, it didn't seem like very much, and we didn't have any tools to actually identify it, so we basically uh, didn't know what it was. This past season, Nancy Gregory at the University of Delaware Clinic was the first one in the region to actually suspect that this was a virus and did a little bit more digging and was able to, by contacting a researcher in uh, the Arkansas, where they basically have identified this virus, were able to then... Uh, positively confirmed that this virus existed in our region. Last season, what appears to have happened is that this virus is, like all viruses, they're moved into plants by a vector. The vector happens to be thrips, and last season it appears that with Tropical Storm Lee from further south, thrips that were carrying the virus were actually brought into our, uh, into our region late in the season, and we saw a more uh, widespread sort of outbreak of this particular virus. Now, we don't know how important this is yet. We don't have any idea uh, whether or not it's going to cause any yield losses. But in Arkansas, uh, where they have uh, seen this develop earlier in the growing season, you can see the disease can develop into larger necrotic patches, and eventually these leaflets actually prematurely defoliate, drop off the plants, and therefore you end up with uh, a potential yield loss kind of a situation. So that's what we want to be concerned about. And it will only happen if it develops early. Now, if it's going to be a problem, this is the season where we're really going to be able to tell that this is going to be a problem in our area. This virus belongs to the same class as tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, it's vectored by the same set of, of, of thrips, essentially. And this virus is persistent in the vector in the thrips, as opposed to, let's say, barley yellow dwarf, which is a, a virus disease that we see in small grains. That vector is aphids. Aphids literally have to feed on something that has the virus and only has about 15 to 30 minutes to, to actually transmit it because the virus does not last in the aphid. In this case, the virus lasts in the thrips and will carry over through the generation, through essentially, at least through the instars into the adult. We don't know about egg stages. Thrips can overwinter in mild winters uh, as adults, so we have a the highest chance of seeing whether or not there was enough of the virus carrying thrips overwintering and could begin an epidemic this, this coming season. Uh, if this becomes a problem, we're probably going to have to deal with this in terms of managing the thrip vector, because that's the only way to really deal with a virus disease. There's nothing you can spray on a plant that is going to take care of a virus. All you can do is prevent the introduction of the virus by managing the insect vector. 
At this stage of the game, we don't know if that's really going to be the case. It's, it's, uh, from our experience with tomato spotted wilt virus in, in vegetables and, and uh, tobacco, it's a very difficult thing to manage because there's many different species of thrips that, that may be involved over a long period of time. So going out there now, planning in terms of an insecticide program uh, is essentially premature. So what we need you to do is to be our eyes and ears, essentially, to look for possible symptoms in soybeans, particularly early in the season. So please, if you see anything like this, particularly if it's anything that has this pattern along the veins, please let us know through the county extension offices. We'll, uh, we'll take some samples. By this summer, we're hoping that there will be some commercial test kits that are available, if not our plant clinic. Uh, the Delaware Clinic and the Virginia Clinic are all getting together and trying to work out a means to actually have a, uh, a test procedure so that they would be able to confirm the presence of this virus. And we'll be able to make better decisions as to what we need to do about this particular problem. Could be a flash in the pan, could be something of significance in the future, so keep that in mind. All right, the other thing I want to mention about soybeans is the last season we had a bunch of purple seed stain, and I want to do a quick review over, of, of that particular problem and how that can be managed, <coughs> or whether or not it really needs to be managed. So purple seed stain is really obvious. It produces this discoloration of the seed coat of soybeans. Literally, it's a fungal infection of the seed coat, and that's only three cell layers. Uh, if you peel off that paper-thin kind of seed coat, there's essentially no infection of the cotyledons or the plant. Uh, at high levels of infection, it can cause a little bit of a problem with stand development, some germination issues. At high levels of development, it's usually mixed in with other moldy kind of uh, seed issues so that you can be docked for moldy seed when you have purple seed stain, but more often than not, if you look at any of the uh, dockage sheets, uh, their purple seed stain is not specifically outlined as a dockage issue. However, um, if you're a seed producer, seed companies don't want to have uh, purplish looking seed or anything that doesn't look like number one yellow uh, seed. Um, and also, if your market where your seed uh, soybean product goes happens to be to an export market, very often uh, it'll also be um, docked or rejected on the basis of purple seed stain because, again, on a simpler basis, what they don't want is a bin full of stuff that doesn't look like number one yellow soybeans. All right? Now, um, typically, uh, purple seed stain develops more or is more likely to develop in early planted and early maturing, early maturing lines. Um, later maturing uh, varieties are still susceptible. There is a timing issue with this disease. It takes a long time to develop, but there's a timing issue that seems to be uh, more likely to happen in, in early maturing lines, particularly if it's early planted. Last season, almost all double crop beans had essentially no uh, purple seed stain. So again, a late planting, uh, regardless if it was an early maturing or later maturing line, ended up without any purple seed stain. Sometimes late harvest can also have an impact on, on, on this. The important thing is that from this, uh, unless you have an, a marketing issue in terms of where your soybeans actually goes, purple seed stain for the most part at most typical infection levels that we see is essentially a cosmetic issue. Uh, this is a, from a fungicide trial we had this past season where we ended up in untreated plots with about 5% purple seed stain. The fungicides that I have listed here, the strobilurin types, uh, headline and quadris, did an excellent job of reducing this. These red numbers are essentially statistically significant, so we got an excellent reduction, a consistent reduction with, with the treatment. The topsin is an old style uh, fungicide, an older class of fungicide that's been the old standard for, for control of this particular disease problem. So you can see all those at 5% level were able to get significant control. But our yield uh, in response from that was essentially negligible, and as there's no statistical difference. At most, you can see here, maybe close to two bushel difference, and that was well within the noise that we would see, so that in terms of being able to say positively this was due to control of that particular disease problem, we did not, we can't really say that. So it does not appear to affect yield at, the, at that level. We do get a little bit of a difference occasionally with the, seed, with, with the fungicide on uh, seed, average seed weight, which can translate for a seed producer to fewer seed required per pound, but it's not enough of a change in seed weight to tr translate into a yield increase. Now that's at the 5% level. Here's, a, here's another trial where we had 25% level of purple seed stain. Again, we see the strobilurin type products do an excellent job of reducing this. Uh, a triazole in this particular case here, uh, a representative triazole, in this case Folicure, does not give us control of purple seed stain. So it's the strobilurin type, so the headline, quadris, the quilts, the, the strategos, all do an excellent job on purple seed stain. 
But even here with a 25% level, even though there's a little bit more noise in the yield data, uh, we did not get any significant difference. And you might ask yourself, well, there's a little bit more bounce here on the, on the yield, so maybe I'm seeing something. But here's an example of why we say that it, it's, it's not associated with this. If you look at the follicular treatment where we did not get control of, of purple seed stain, we got the high yield just like we did with the headline here. So controlling purple seed stain did not result in the yield advantage that you might see in this particular case. So purple seed stain, even in a situation where we got 25%, is essentially a cosmetic issue. You're not going to see a particular yield loss. And for most cases, uh, it is a, a, a crop that will be useful and can be managed, you know, um, um, <clears throat> It doesn't have any issues essentially with this particular disease, uh, except for those cases, like I said, and where it might go in terms of a market. So if it's a seed market, you might not be able to utilize that. If it's an export market, you might get docked for that. Uh, but we can manage it with fungicides in that particular case. All right, so that's the purple seed stain story kind of quickly. I want to get to uh, small grains here now and talk about something that people have been asking some questions about uh, uh, recently. And we had wonderful opportunity to do this on a little bit larger scale so we were, uh, to be able to answer this particular question. And that is, is there a role of fungicides? Do they give us any benefit if we can apply them essentially now in the growing season where we're looking at uh, either nitrogen applications in the springtime or our herbicide applications? All right, so let's go into this a little bit. Um, and kind of like Frank's answer to some of the question, it, it has... It kind of depends on the disease as to whether or not you have a potential to see a response. Uh, I have here on this slide our major foliar disease problems in small grains that respond well to fungicides that we might see in this particular area. And they all have slightly different properties that has uh, bearing on whether or not uh, an early fungicide program would really uh, help them uh, in management of those particular problems. So on the right-hand side, we have the two sort of necrotic-type leaf spots. This is gloom blotch and on the leaf when it develops, and it has to develop on the leaves before it actually develops on the heads. And this is tan spot. This is a cool weather kind of a disease problem that we can, can also get, which is very similar to, to, to um, uh, gloom blotch. Uh, both of these, gloom blotch and tan spot, are diseases are f caused by fungi that cannot move large distances, all right? They're basically moved by rain splash. So therefore, they are a problem only in fields where we have had a history of small grains and we have either close rotations or we've essentially um, um, went back in uh, wheat after wheat or, or perhaps wheat after a wheat double crop kind of a bean situation so that we would have uh, wheat stubble right in the field. So that's the source of inoculum. It's very important in terms of setting us up for a disease situation with those two diseases and could result in uh, requiring or perhaps getting a benefit from an early fungicide program because you could get an early start in that situation. On the left-hand side, we have uh, powdery mildew and two rusts. Now, powdery mildew is a, is a season-wide or season-long kind of problem that we've certainly dealt with a lot in the area. And this one is a potential candidate for an early fungicide program on susceptible varieties. And I'll show you some data on that. That's where we actually were able to look at. The rusts, on the other hand, do not overwinter in our area. They have to blow in from long distances. They tend to do so late in the season. So an early fungicide program is essentially way too early to have an effect on the rusts in, in our particular area. All right? Now, I want to make sure that you all realize, because it's been a very mild winter, these two rusts are right now starting big time in the south, so that we have a very good chance of seeing something like stripe rust or leaf rust this season later on because it is building up in the south. So that if the weather patterns are right, we could certainly see an influx of inoculum this season more so than we have in the past couple. So keep that in mind. Now, the, what we're looking at is, as we're coming out of winter dormancy, wheat plants and barley plants start to green up, the initial green up is essentially just new leaf tissue that's being developed. Some plants uh, tend to lay on kind of let flat on the soil surface during the wintertime, uh, during dormancy, if there was dormancy. Um, and so when they green up, essentially it's just new, new leaf tissue that is, that is developing, but they appear to sort of pick themselves off the ground. At the next stage of development is the stage of development where the wheat spike, the head is actually being formed just at the soil surface essentially right above the, the nodes there in, in, in the crown. And at growth stage six is when we actually can find a node easily by peeling off the tissue because it's starting to be pushed up out of the, out of the ground. Um, what I want you to think about here is two things. 
Fungicides are not as systemic as herbicides or uh, several insecticides, all right? So they're a wonderful product. Um, the, the new classes of materials uh, do not require absolute coverage because of their locally systemic properties, essentially. When a, a fungicide drop lands on a leaf, it'll be absorbed by the leaf and moved in that leaf tissue, so you get very good coverage even if you don't have complete coverage of, uh, w with spray solution. But that leaf, that fungicide that landed on that leaf will not move into new tissue, okay? So they're, they're systemic only in a local sense, not in the sense that as the plant continues to grow and develop, they'll be moving uh, fungicide product into the upper part of the plant. So if we look at a wheat plant at, this is a main tiller, at jointing, all right, there's a joint, there's a little node uh, right underneath my thumb. This is the main stem of a, of a wheat plant, essentially, at this, at a little bit, well, it could be now in some fields around here, actually. Um, but uh, within the next uh, couple of weeks or something like that, we, typically we would find this. I want you to think in terms of the top leaf, in this case, on a plant at this stage of the game, all right? What do you think this leaf represents on the mature plant at the end of the season. Here's a drawing of a mature plant at the end of the season. The head is just coming out of the boot. Flag leaf is at the top, then we label them flag minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on down the canopy. So what do you think this top leaf is at jointing in comparison to the mature plant at the end of the season? Flag leaf, okay, anyone else have, an, have a suggestion? You think it's the top leaf? Flag minus two, good, good guesses. It's actually flag minus three, all right? So now, remember, when we, in the 80s when we started looking at high yield management wheat, basically there, there's been a lot of really nice work that shows that the yield that we get in wheat comes from the upper canopy leaves. Primarily the flag leaf, flag minus one leaf, and a small percentage from the flag minus two. So when we're applying, applying a fungicide at jointing, we're protecting the canopy that's below those leaves that are critical for uh, yield production, all right? Now, this can still work in terms of disease management because the early developing diseases need to build up within the canopy to move up in, into, the, into the upper part of the canopy. But remember, the fungicide applied at joining, there will be no fungicide in the flag, my, flag, flag minus one, or flag minus two leaves. So there's, uh, those leaves are unprotected. All right, keep that in mind. All right, now, joint, in case you didn't know, uh, Later on in the season, easy to tell, the, the, it's, a, it's that knobby piece of tissue uh, that's, uh, that's uh, on the straw. Uh, as we all know, wheat and barley essentially is a straw, which is a hollow stem. There's only a couple of places along the stem where we have a solid piece, essentially, and it's, and it's marked by that swollen leaf tissue. At these early stages of the game, it's a lot harder to find that joint. Here's a, here's a wheat plant at growth stage five. You can just barely see a little discoloration up here. That's actually the wheat head. So if you're careful at peeling it apart, you'll actually find all the little kernels are, uh, are already determined. Uh, and uh, well, actually, they're ovaries at this stage of the game. And as the plant continues to grow, the inner node elongates, and that's when you start pushing it up above ground, and the node gets a little bit larger. It's an easier, easier to tell. Um, barley plant, because it's a compressed, a little bit earlier season, uh, in this case, actually, is a little bit more likely to see a response to an early fungicide program because at jointing, this is a little bit later in the game than I showed you in the wheat picture, you can actually see the node here if you're, if you're up close, this top leaf is actually the flag minus one leaf. So we're protecting much more of the canopy in the barley case than we are in the wheat case. And we use barley and large plots, essentially, to try to test this system, especially because barley today, thoroughbred barley in particular, is very susceptible. So we have uh, a good model system for something that's very susceptible to powdery mildew, and it has a better chance of seeing a response from an early fungicide program because we're protecting more of the canopy. So with that in mind, uh, here's some data from that we collected at the Y. This is tilt applied at growth stage six, which is adjoining, tilt at nine, which is when the flag leaf is fully uh, developed. Here's quilt at flag leaf that is fully developed, and then here's Prosar, which is a triazole product that we use for scab control uh, later in the season at essentially heading. All these products, essentially, even the tilt at growth stage six, significantly reduced the amount of powdery mildew that was on the flag leaf, even though that material, essentially, at growth stage six, was applied well before the flag leaf was ever formed. So, unprotected, but reduced the amount of disease development within the canopy, and it did reduce the amount of powdery mildew that, that showed up on the flag leaf. 
But because those flag leaves were unprotected, leaf rust came in. All right? Even though we got a significant reduction, these early applications definitely did not do as well as the late applications in terms of reducing leaf rust. And the end result was, we did get a little bit of a yield boost here with the, with the tilt ply to growth stage six. However, the only significant yield advantage was by going on late in the season, waiting and getting protection of the upper canopy and getting other diseases as well. So the big bang for the buck came from the later fungicide application. At another location, slightly different mix of diseases, basically the same story. We are getting some advantage from the early fungicide program on a very susceptible uh, plant of that to powdery mildew. However, this doesn't necessarily translate into yield advantages or significant yield advantages because we have much better bet of seeing a yield response to fungicides applied at least at flag leaf, if not at heading. All right. In wheat, on another trial where we had uh, we went wheat double crop soybean, we went after double crop soybeans so that we would have more tan spot in this, or gloom blotch. In this case, with gloom blotch, just quick rundown on the yields. This was headline applied at, at uh, early, um, essentially a little bit before joining. And this is tilt followed by quilt. This is quilt and, and this is headline at, uh, um, at uh, flag leaf. You would think that the tilt followed by quilt is essentially giving you a, a, a nice response, but since this component of this is quilt at the same state as it is here, all of your yield advantage from this treatment is essentially coming from the late application of the quilt, as you can see here. All right? So this is quilt at the same rate applied at uh, boot stage. That was part of the package that was applied here. So two fungicide applications did not out outperform the single fungicide application at the end of the season, even with, this, with the, the gloom blotch story. So the bottom line is joining applications will make the plants look a little bit better, with the, depending on the disease issue that we have. But we definitely get more bang for the buck with a later fungicide application in terms of getting a, a real yield response. Okay, I want to review SCAB. Uh, the handout that, that Jenny gave you, this little brochure, has a good a summary of what I'm talking about here today, as well as some additional information. But I want to kind of quick run down, since this is a significant problem and it's a little bit tricky for us, um, and uh, we, we need to all be on the same page. So, we all know this disease, it's been, uh, we're seeing it more often. Uh, we get this partial bleaching, premature bleaching of the heads, sometimes full bleaching of the heads, two to three weeks after flowering. Uh, scabby inf infection produces seed, seed that's discolored and shriveled, and more importantly, that discovered and shriveled seed will have uh, fungal toxins develop in them. A uh, most notable one is called vomitoxin, also known as DON, D-O-N, uh, and you can get a whole load essentially rejected on the basis of, of the vomitoxins. The thing that we have to realize why is this becoming a more significant problem or a more frequent problem for us is that we have a rotation that sets us up for a problem. We have a uh, change our, our practices so that it essentially sets us up for a problem. This fungus also causes stalk rots and ear rots in corn. Our typical rotation for small grains is following corn, and we're now doing it essentially in a minimum till uh, fashion if we're disking the ground, and sometimes in a no-till fashion. So by leaving the corn debris on the soil surface, even if we didn't get lodging in the corn, the fungus is prevalent in the soil. What it'll do is it'll colonize the, the, the tissue over the winter uh, so that by the time the wheat plants are essentially starting to produce a head and producing flowers, they will colonize the tissue, produces fruiting bodies. These fruiting bodies of this fungus will actually then eject spores into, into the air and they mature at a time when our wheat and barley plant is flowering. So at peak susceptibility, this fungus is producing spores. So that's a, a cropping system that is essentially setting us up for a problem. The good news is we do have plenty of varieties and essentially everybody, Publix to, through most of the major brands, have something that has some resistance to this particular disease. And in a nursery where we inoculate and mist and, and try to get heavy infection, we can actually show you that the, the potential for these varieties in terms of how much toxin they can develop. Uh, we have stuff that's very susceptible in the 9 to 10 bracket, but most of the resistant varieties are somewhere in this 2 to just under 2 part per million kind of range in terms of their potential. Everybody has something, all right? So that's the good news. We need to start picking varieties that have this resistance because... Our only other tool is fungicides, and they're just like the resistance, they're only going to give us partial control. Now, the other reason we need to be concerned with this type of resistance is 
This type of resistance is not actually resistance to infection. We can measure this by putting a spore droplet right on the heads at flowering. A resistant variety will only get maybe one or two spikelets will become infected, so it's not resistance to infection. They will get infected. But in comparison to the susceptible variety, where you'll get movement of the uh, fungus in the rachis in the head, uh, this restricts the amount of movement of the fungus once it actually gets in the plant. And in nature, it, if we have a rainy season at flowering, we can get multiple infections at the head so that a resistant variety with multiple infections essentially will look like a susceptible variety. So that type of resistance alone is not going to be enough in a bad disease year to essentially get us a crop that will have less than two parts per million don. Two parts per million don appears to be what the local mills and elevators are now willing to accept. They believe that since the uh, requirement, FDA requirement for human consumption of wheat products is one part per million, that if they can get a truckload that's two part per million, they'll be able to find enough clean wheat to blend it to get it down below one. But anything above that becomes a lot harder to deal with. So two parts per million is sort of our production target in terms of being able to uh, uh, have a saleable crop. Now, the fungicides, like I mentioned, there's really only two recommended fungicides, Prosaro and Caramba. They give us about 50% control of the symptoms that we see, that bleaching, and a little bit less in terms of the toxin development. All right, So um, a, a susceptible variety is not going to be saved by a fungicide application in a bad disease year. And let me, what it's going to have to come down to is integrating our practices and most importantly, at least picking a resistant variety and packaging it with a fungicide when needed. I'll go over this in a second, but let me just show you, illustrate this from, from data last season. We planted six different varieties across a wide range of susceptibility in, in multiple locations. This is in our Western Maryland location where we got uh, natural disease infection. We planted no-till into corn stubble. And the red bars are unprotected without a fungicide, essentially. And uh, these are the levels of toxin we got. So again, the very susceptible variety from the south here, again, close to nine parts per million. We add a fungicide and we can really do a significant drop in the, in, in the toxin level, but it's still six parts per million or above, and essentially we can't sell this product. Varieties that were sort of in the middle category, the, on, the, on the nursery data that were in the, the three, four, five parts per million, essentially, again, they, they had a very significant levels. With a fungicide, with these that are sort of moderately resistant, we're able to get very close to that two part per million level. Varieties that had uh, less than three parts per million in the nursery kind of data uh, were very easy, essentially with a fungicide, to drop below the two part per million level. So this illustrates very cleanly and clearly that you need some resistance to really take a, get a benefit out of the fungicide program to get us to a, a level where we'll be able to sell uh, our product. Now, one of the issues that's obvious to everybody is that there's a very narrow window as to when these fungicides need to go on in terms of being effective. Uh, this is the only year where I had a fungicide application of our recommended products at heading where I actually got a significant reduction in the amount of toxins. Typically, we say as close to flowering, initial flowering as possible. This window is really only about a five to 10 day window at max in terms of when the fungicide needs to go on to really give you a significant reduction of the toxin. The other thing to note here is there is an occasional spike from other products if they're applied close to flowering, especially if they have a strobilurin component to them. This doesn't always happen, but it does happen. So my recommendation is the closer we get to heading, if you're using fungicides as a management program, you need to think about moving to triazole type products the closer you are getting to, the, to essentially heading and flowering to avoid this potential problem. So keep that in mind. Now, because this is tied very closely to environmental conditions at flowering and just before, there is a forecast system. It's available to you. The, the website information is available in that brochure. Uh, this forecast system basically takes the weather for the 10-day period, 5 to 7-day period prior to this, this stage uh, when we're looking at it and gives you a, a risk assessment as to whether or not this is a high disease risk year or not. I also provide some commentary at this website. There's information in that brochure. You can also sign up for essentially alerts so that you can either get an email or text message as to whenever there's a change on this map. All right, so you can, you can utilize this tool to help you make a decision as to whether or not this is a year where you need to find your site or not. Uh, the last thing with respect to managing scab, if you do get scab, it is very important that you adjust or have the uh, custom combine or adjust their combine to maximize the clean out. It's that light, 
uh, seed that's infected, essentially infected seed is a lot lighter. If we blow that out, that's where the high toxin content is. If we can blow that out, clean that out, we're going to do a big job at reducing the amount of toxin that will actually be measured in the, in the bin or in the, in the truckload. So uh, adjusting the combine, making sure we clean out the light chaffy seed does a very good job in reducing the amount of toxin that shows up. In terms of use of that seed as a seed source for the following season, it's really not an issue. It's not going to um, increase the risk of scab next season at all. And typical seed treatments, uh, dividend raxel, essentially uh, in this trial, uh, across a bunch of trials here um, from uh, Kansas, they got an average of 25% uh, improvement in stand just by using standard uh, seed treatment products. So we can utilize that seed as a seed source and it doesn't change the risk picture for the following season in terms of getting that disease developed. So um, the um, recommendations are outlined in that brochure. I don't want to kind of belabor that point anymore. I want to, if I can, take a, uh, just a, a couple minutes to talk a little bit about corn fungicides because similar to, this, to the wheat and barley story, there's another question that's coming up that because of some work that's been done in the Midwest is can I get any benefit from a fungicide if I put it on essentially at side rest time? Essentially, again, we're going over the field, take advantage of the fact that we're having equipment going across the field. Is there a benefit to using a fungicide at that particular point in time? So I want to show you a little bit of data, again, from our trials this, uh, where we have gray leaf spot. Our number one foliar disease problem is gray leaf spot. Fungicides are going to give you a bang for your buck when you have a foliar disease problem. This disease is a late season kind of a developing disease. It doesn't really show up very early in the season. So you aren't going to see anything essentially at uh, essentially uh, side rest time. In this situation where we got gray leaf spot at the end of the season about 5% on the ear leaf and above, that's about a level where we start seeing fungicide responses. All right? When we applied headline at V6, essentially at side rest time, we got a little bit of reduction in gray leaf spot, essentially, and a little bit of a yield boost, but we did not match the yield boost that we got if we applied it at essentially a tassel to beginning of silking. That's where we got our big yield boost. And the combination essentially did not outperform uh, the fungicide application at tassel or uh, uh, silking. And here's another trial, essentially same story with different products. Quadrus a little bit later at V8. Quadrus followed by Quilt Excel at 10.5 10, uh, 10 fluid ounces at R1. Uh, it's the R1 applications where we're getting a, a response in terms of controlling uh, gray leaf spot. And essentially, in this case, a uh, little bit different timing on things. We did not even see a yield response uh, due to the fungicide at R1, mainly because we didn't have enough gray leaf spot on those plants to really cause enough damage to see a response to the fungicide. So the bottom line is, unless we have something that moves in early, perhaps a different disease problem, essentially like northern corn leaf blight, um, our main problem is gray leaf spot. We do not see any particular benefit from applying a fungicide early in the game because essentially, again, like the wheat story, we're protecting the lower part of the canopy. That's not the major uh, source of photosynthesis that goes to the grain. We need to have essentially fungicide on the middle and upper part of the canopy to really get a response to protect those tissues. And actually, that's when we see uh, a real benefit from a fungicide on a susceptible hybrid. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have. And I'm very thankful that my th voice held up this far. Yeah. Questions for R? Oh, come on. Wasn't that good? <laughs> yes. Has anyone looked at uh, a fall treatment on the, the, the leftover stover to knock back the, the parent, I guess, say, of a... This is you're talking about scab? Yes. Okay, very good question. The, uh, the question was, is there... Any researcher, anyone been looking at putting something on the stover during the fall or something like that to reduce the development of the fungus? And actually, there, uh, there is some indication that uh, actually fertilizer at that point in time will help to speed up the decay of that. Uh, however, the bottom line is you still have a lot of organic matter. This fungus uh, not only works as a pathogen, but as a decay organism. So it's still going to be there and it still produces enough spores so that essentially we don't see much of a response to that at all. A better thing to do is essentially, if you can, is essentially to grow uh, wheat after beans or at least start having some of the crop that, that could be a, under a different kind of a rotation so that you're not right in corn stubble. So far, we don't really have anything that we can apply in the corn stubble that will actually uh, reduce the population of the fungus w 
well enough through essentially springtime uh, to, uh, to see a response. So good thought. Lots of people thought of that too. And unfortunately, no success on that yet. So any other questions? Yes. Again, that's a that's a, the question is the tillage take care of the corn stubble and and, and reduce the amount of disease development. Uh, yes, it has an effect. The interesting thing is it's it's kind of a sanit what we call a sanitation effect. If we get it down to only ten percent of the corn debris that we had there, there can still be enough inoculum in that in a bad disease year to see enough disease development. So we usually tend to see a drop in the severity, and in moderate years that's a, it makes a difference. But in disease favorable years, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. So, good question. Yes, in the back. Um, not sure I'm following what aspect you want to address. Well, you're applying fungicides to reduce the um, infected organism. Uh, how, are you, um, how are you balancing that? With the normal decay process of the, of the, of the okay. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the question is, when you use fungicides uh, uh, in, in these programs, essentially, you're also affecting then the organisms that are going to be important in the decay of that orga of organic matter, so that the, the nutrient cycling that's involved there. As a general rule, because of the timing that we have in a lot of these fungicides, there should be enough breakdown of that product essentially by the end of the growing season that there's not much uh, fungicidal activity in that debris uh, to have a, a significant effect. So it, it does not appear to have a major effect on the rates of decay of, of the organic matter as long as they're applied according to label instructions early enough in the, during the growing season. So the plant, those materials only last about two to three weeks at concentrations where they're actually doing a fungicidal kind of a role and the plant is breaking that down. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Arv. Oh, yeah, give that back to Frank. Um, let's hear from a couple more of our sponsors. Um, Matt Lewis is here from Bayer. We'll tell you why Matt's coming up. Any, if anybody's going to be hiring any teenagers to work on the farm and they're going to be operating uh, any equipment, if they're age 14 to 16, they have to attend a tractor school, and there will be one starting uh, Monday, March 12th. It's going to be joint between Queen Anne and Kent County, but it'll start at the Kent County office, and then they kind of move all around. So, Matt? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, my name is Matt Lewis uh, with Bear Crop Science. All right, hopefully everybody can hear me now. Matt Lewis with uh, Bear Crop Science. Uh, been working for Bear now for about a year. Uh, was an extension agent in Virginia for about 10 years prior to that. Just like to thank everybody uh, for their support of, of Bear Crop Science materials on your farms over the years. I hope you've been getting excellent results. Uh, you probably know us for things like Osprey, uh, things like Ignite, which is now Liberty. Even they didn't warn me about that. You'll notice all my marketing materials outside still say Ignite. Uh, main thing I want you to know about that, there's been no formulation change. It's still the still the same product that, that, uh, that you, you've known well over time. Um, and just want to let you know that we do have uh, some newer materials coming out that I think can help you on the farm. Uh, you heard Dr. Ritter talk about Caprino this morning. Uh, I think there's an excellent fit for that where you're dealing with fall in Texas panicum uh, in your corn as well as many other weeds. Uh, and you certainly had uh, <coughs> heard what uh, Dr. Gabraskas had to say about Prosaro. And I uh, want to make sure that you understand with Prosaro fungicide, we're not only taking care of scab, but all of the late season uh, diseases that we would normally be concerned about in our wheat. So uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, let's see. Where's Buddy Cahall? There he comes. Buddy Cahall here is from uh, Crow Insurance Agency, and he represents um, nationwide agribusiness. I have to tell you a little story about Buddy. Uh, you know that I teach uh, Annie's project, and it's all for farm women. So we usually don't let men come to the class, but uh, Buddy was brave enough to come and teach our class, and he actually survived. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. They were they were pretty friendly. They weren't too too violent. Too to, yeah, they weren't too bad. Um, Jenny, you do a great job with this program, and we appreciate the opportunity to help sponsor it because uh, you know I get around a lot in different parts of New Jersey and here, and I think 
of all I see, this is one of the better programs. And like Jenny said, I'm Buddy Cahill. I work with Crow Insurance Agency out of Middletown, Delaware. And we're a nationwide insurance agency. Um, we do everything from home, auto, and life. And we also do nationwide agribusiness, which is farm, and rain and hail crop insurance, which I specialize in both of those. Um, I recommend to you, take the time once a year to meet with your agent and do a review. And probably my most favorite reviews are when you have several family members or people who are involved in the operation there at the table. And start at the beginning of it and go right through it page by page until you understand it and you have all your questions answered. Because your operations change. If you bring another family member into it, I feel they should be a named insured on the policy. And it makes them feel better to be included too. Go down through your farm personal property, which is your tractors, your equipment, your hay and straw, and review it all the time. It'll be two hours very well spent. Once you do it one time, you can go through it even faster. Pick the day, you know, pick a rainy day when you know you don't want to be outside. So that's my advice for today. All right, thanks again. Okay. See ya. Is tomorrow going to be a rainy day? Could be. Tomorrow could be a rainy day. So um, Ned McElveen uh, is here from DuPont. Ned, thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I just I had a very few comments, but uh, you heard Ron Renner uh, this morning mention some things about uh, on the ALS resistant chickweed. There's really not many answers. There's really only, only one answer out there, and that's the uh, Starine Ultra, and of course tank mix with Harmony Extra because we need something that's going to cover us on the uh, on the wild garlic. And also, I wanted to mention on uh, as far as wild garlic is concerned, if uh, if you have no-till wheat or if you have uh, you know a lot of garlic pressure, uh, we recommend that you do make uh, two applications of Harmony Extra to make sure you don't have that dockage. Uh, you also heard uh, Ron Ritter mention some things about uh, bases and bases blend in terms of the value there that that it brings to uh, controlling some of these uh, tough pigweeds and. Uh, but that's basically all I had, and appreciate your business, and hope you have a very successful 2012. We hope we have a very successful 2012, too, I can tell you that. Uh, how about Jackie? Jackie King is here from um, King Crop Insurance. They have been certainly diligent supporters. We have uh, three sisters that work together. I wonder how that's working out for you ladies, or do you keep spread out? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. As she says, I'm Jackie King with King Crop Insurance. And uh, I just wanted to kind of remind you guys that March 15th is the deadline to do anything with your crop insurance for the spring planted crops. Yesterday, um, I haven't seen it approved, but the corn price came in for the price per bushel for crop insurance at 568 and soybeans at 1260. So that will help you calculate your um, guarantees and, and your um, premiums and everything for 2012. The other thing I just wanted to bring out a little caution on was um, wheat and barley has, you know, had a little bit of a warm winter, so we're not really sure exactly how it's going to turn out. Just want to remind you to make sure that you put in a notice of loss with your crop insurance agent if you think that you're going to destroy your wheat or barley. Uh, the big thing is that the projected price on wheat came in last year at 820 and for barley at 688 so if there's you know any indemnity for that you'd want to make sure you didn't leave any money on the table by destroying any of your wheat so thank you again thank you Jenny right. oh, thank you really oh thank you <laughs> you're too kind uh, mr. Miller let's see from Martin's uh, limestone Mr. Miller makes a track down every year from Pennsylvania. He said he made out fine this morning. He had, it was a nice morning to come to Maryland. Been coming down along quite a while. Most of you know who Martin is, and we appreciate that business very much. Uh, the biggest thing I'd talk about today would be is if you got orders in, don't be afraid to call in and, and to talk to the dispatcher. Communication is the best thing we can do right now. We are behind a good, a good bit. 
But if you uh, uh, talk to them, because conditions get a lot different between the two places. I mean, we can get rain, you don't. We get wind, you don't. Those things make a big factor in whether we can get into your, to your, uh, get your lime spread for you, and so forth. Thank you so much for all the all the years of service, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Rohr is here from AgriLab. Bill started a new lab. Has it been? Has it been two years now? Works out very well for us, as you know, as our office, we take soil samples and send them off. So now uh, Bill actually comes once a week and picks them up. Um, soil samples, manure samples, so thank you for that service. It helps us tremendously. Thank you, Jenny, and this is a this is a great program. So thanks for putting it together and having the opportunity to to get up here. I I um, first thing I like to say is uh, there are a lot of familiar faces in the crowd here, and, and most of you are, are customers. And we will never have uh, made it to the second year if it wasn't for the uh, the business of that first year. So my hats off to you. Thank you for the support, and we're uh, we're proud to be an important part of uh, agriculture here in Delmarva. Uh, if you're not familiar with AgriLab, it's, uh, we're entering our second year. We, uh, our primary business is analyzing soil, uh, soil for fertility and also nitrate. Uh, we do plant analysis, petiole analysis, uh, manure analysis, and water analysis. Uh, we, our primary uh, marketplace is the Delmarva Peninsula. We have customers uh, as far south as uh, Cape Charles, and up to the Wilmington area, we, we do some business in the Lancaster, Lebanon area and the South Jersey area, but our, our core uh, business is right here on the Delmarva Peninsula. The, uh, the lab is located in Milford, Delaware. Uh, I live in Caroline County, Maryland, and uh, usually once a week we make a trip around the peninsula. We come through this area, so uh, we do business with most of the fertilizer companies in this area, so if you... Um, uh, if you ask them or if you contact our office, we'll be sure to schedule some type of uh, coordination so that we can get samples. Yep, your office works too. So uh, again, uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to stand up here as the um, primary owner or, or the owner and the uh, general manager of AgriLab that survived that first critical year that uh, most small businesses have a uh, difficult time surviving, but we survived and thank you. Thanks, Bill. Mike Kelly. Mike, you want to say something? Uh, just like to say, say thank you for uh, using Pioneer products and good luck. Okay. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate your support. Thank you.